Okay, hello everyone. This is Chris from the Pain and Glory blog. I am back with another Blood and Valor So You Want to Play video. Sorry, it's been a bit of a while. I've been busy with work for the last couple of weeks, but I am still planning on doing all of the different factions or nations in Blood and Valor. Today, we are back with the first of the central powers, the Germans, the big one, right? You can't have a world war without uh, someone for the French and the British to fight against, and that is the Kaiser and the German Empire. So let's get right into it. Why do you want to play the Germans? Well, number one, Pickle Hab. No, just kidding. But I mean, Pickle Hab, they're ridiculous. They're, they're ridiculous helmets. Uh, they didn't offer any protection there. I believe they were made of some sort of um, leather or occasionally even like a compressed paper cardboard. Um, they, were, they were purely uh, ornamental. They were not protective at all, which is why the Germans eventually went on to develop the Stahlhelm pictured um, in the bottom left picture that you can see. It's a bit bigger than the World War II style helm, but very, very similar. But still, the uniforms of the Germans in World War II, and, and you can see um, some examples here, they are some fun uniforms to paint while not being overwhelming, right? There's a lot of uh, what the Germans called Feldgrau, field, field gray, which is really more of like a like gray green um, and there's a lot of different tones of field gray, so you can really do a lot with that field gray there. Um, other reasons to play the Germans, well, if, you, if you're uncomfortable playing Germans in World War II, don't worry, you're not the World War II Germans. Uh, are you the bad guys? Well, I mean, are there bad guys in World War I? Did the Germans cause World War I? I mean, the Treaty of Versailles made them say that they did, but if anyone caused World War I, Let's all admit it was the Austrians. The Austrians caused World War One. If anyone's a bad guy, it, it's them. Okay, we we can all agree Austrians. Stupid reason to start the war, but someone's got to help the Austrians because the Austrians certainly are not going to win World War One on their own. They they could barely fight the Serbs and the Italians on their own. So you know, the Germans are here to kind of pick up the slack and mostly fight this war, not entirely single handedly, but mostly single handedly. Uh, Germans, they fought over, all over the world. Um, the Western Front, obviously, uh, against France and Britain, but also the Eastern Front against, uh, well, Russia for part of the war when Russia was still in the war before the Russian Revolution. The Eastern Front is, uh, tech, I've been, I have been told, I will not say with 100% certainty, but that there will be separate Eastern Front list for the Germans coming out in the uh, new Blood and Valor book, which is scheduled to come out hopefully sometime. Uh, very end of 2020 or early 2021s. So you can of course just use the generic Western Front uh, German uh, list uh, as an Eastern Front German list until that comes out. Um, you also have East Africa. There were German colonies in East Africa where there was fighting. Uh, the Germans fought in the Mediterranean. They helped out the Ottomans a bit. There were German colonies out in Asia, but I believe they fell pretty quickly. You could, you know, maybe you could find some interesting examples of fighting over there and some interesting uniforms. Uh, the Germans probably have some of the most unique unit choices. Now, unlike the French and the British, which had some named uh, characters in non-command units, so they had some named special character riflemen, some named special character snipers, and et cetera, the Germans don't have any named units that are not command. And they do have a, a decent number of named command units you can pick, but where the Germans make up for that is that they have some units that no other uh, armies have, namely the stormtroopers, uh, which are close combat specialists, but special kind we'll get to, and of course the flamethrower. And then uh, one interesting reason why I think it's it's really great to play the Germans is that they have plastic figures. As far as I am aware, the War Games Atlantic plastic Germans pictured uh, over there on the top right are the only plastic World War I figures for 28 millimeter that any company makes. Now, I believe they're coming out with World War I French in plastic at some point in the next uh, year. Uh, but for now, if you want to play 28 millimeter Blood and Valor, the absolute rock bottom cheapest way to do that is you could buy a single box of War Games Atlantic plastic Germans for, depending on where you buy from, $30 to $35. Um, it's not gonna come with any heavy support weapons like uh, heavy machine guns, but 
any kind of basic infantry you could possibly think of building. Uh, as you can see, we have an officer, we have riflemen. In the back left, we've got a guy with a uh, MG-08, uh, the light machine gun variant. And then we have a stormtrooper with an MP-18 submachine gun over in the top uh, right. So uh, you could do a sniper there, maybe if you add a little conversion scope to your figure. Uh, very easy to make almost all of the German units out of that single box. Pretty much the only things you can't make, again, light machine gun, or I'm sorry, heavy machine gun, and also flamethrower. Although if you really wanted to, you could do some conversion work and, and make a flamethrower out of them. But let's move on. What, what do the Germans rules-wise look like? Because one of the things in Blood of Valor is that a rifleman is a rifleman is a rifleman. The stats are all pretty much the same, but each nation has their unique flavor. And so the Germans gave a rule called Blood and Steel. I'm not even I know it's Blut and Stahl, but I'm not going to do the German pronunciation this entire video. So what does Blood and Steel do? It gives every German core unit and command unit and most of the support units the True Grit special rule. True Grit means units can reroll failed results during close combat save tests, which means once you have a German infantry unit in close combat, it's not that they're necessarily doing more damage. It's that they are harder to kill. So Germans are a force that specializes in getting into close combat and then winning that close combat, um, maybe not by killing you faster, but by surviving longer. And some of the unit choices that they have to choose really reinforce that, like the stormtroopers and the flamethrower. So what are their unit choices? Of course, we've got the standard commander options, lieutenant, captain, and major. In terms of special characters, we have three. We have um, essentially Hauptmann is captain. So we have Captain Erwin Rommel. You probably heard of him, the Desert Fox from World War II, but way before he was getting famous as a German field marshal in World War II, he was a infantry captain in World War I. He started at the beginning of the war as a lieutenant. Uh, he was very um, well-regarded and um, awarded medals in the Western Front before going on to lead a specialized mountain battalion in Italy where he literally helped develop the infancy, infantry assault tactics that would become stormtrooper tactics and then also eventually become infantry assault tactics of World War II for the Germans. So he is extremely influential in the development of modern infantry assault tactics. His book on infantry assault tactics was read not just in Germany but worldwide after World War I. Uh, we also have Captain Johann von Ravenstein. Uh, he was a, uh, another infantry officer who fought in a lot of the major Western Front battles. He, uh, his, one of his unique claims to fame is he and a handful of the men in his battalion captured a bridge, uh, 1,500 prisoners and 32 artillery. Uh, the source had cannons. I'm assuming they meant artillery and we're not talking like 12 pounder Napoleonics here. Um, almost, you know, not single-handedly. He had some, some guys with him, but uh, it was pretty remarkable success there. Uh, finally, we have Lieutenant Ernst Junger, probably more famous for what he did after World War I. He wrote Storm of Steel, um, a book glorifying the combat of World War I and kind of the soldier's life. But he was a highly regarded soldier during the war. Uh, he was wounded seven times. He won a variety of medals. Even before the war, he was actually a member of the French Foreign Legion. But uh, at the beginning of World War I, he left the French Foreign Legion to go back to his native uh, Germany and uh, serve in the Imperial uh, Army. Uh, over on the right, we got the rest of the units. Of course, we have the core regular riflemen and the inexperienced riflemen, along with the options. We have a sniper, heavy machine gun, the close combat stormtroopers, a flamethrower, like I said, unique for the Germans. If you're in the early war, you can take cavalry. And then for um, off-table support, we have pretty standard artillery and gas barrages. So nothing crazy for the Germans other than that rather unique flamethrower and the stormtroopers are a bit different from some other nations close combat. Uh, let's talk about the rules of our specialty commanders. So for our command choices, again, we have the free uh, lieutenant, the uh, 15 point captain with the extra command point, meaning he gets to throw around two orders per turn. Uh, the major with that longer command range, uh, much uh, very helpful in a uh, bigger, games, um, more 200 to 250 or more points, where you might be playing on, instead of a three by three table, you might be playing on a, a four by three or even a six by three table. That 12 inches becomes extremely helpful, uh, both in ordering your units, but also in um, granting them that minus one to their resolve check uh, score so that they can um, stay in combat better. 
uh, for our special commanders. Uh, Ernst Young pictured up in the top there. Uh, he's 30 points, so he's pretty expensive. He's, he's, you know, technically he's a lieutenant, but he is more expensive than a major. He gets the two command points of the captain or the major, but only an eight inch command range like the lieutenant or the captain. So, so he really is kind of like a juiced up captain in that he grants a bonus to initiative rolls. It's nice, it's not critical, but a minus two to resolve checks instead of a minus one to resolve checks, that is very nice. Is he worth the 30 points in combat? I don't know, especially with the with the eight inch command range. If you're playing on a smaller table, uh, maybe you want to put points into him. If you're playing on a bigger table, I think that eight inch is really going to hurt you. Uh, going into the more expensive, um, Captain Johann von Ravenstein, 35 points. He, he does get that 12 inch command range, two command points, uh, tied initiative rolls plus one. And then at the start of the game, two units get advanced setup. You're going to see this rule a lot on the Germans. It really plays into their uh, close combat oriented play style. Advanced setup means after deployment, but before the first uh, activation of the game, uh, the unit gets to run, which means A, they get to move up to eight inches, but B, they also get the run token. And remember, your board is only going to be 36 inches deep. So that is, um, that is almost a quarter of the board, not quite, that you're able to move up before you even activate. And then you're running, so you're going to be harder to hit. Um, it's going to be a good way. He, yes, he is expensive, but he is actually only five points more than a major. I think those five points for that advanced setup is probably worth it. Finally, we have um, Erwin Rommel, 50 points. He is the most expensive command option in the entire game. I could not find another option as expensive as him. He's more expensive than the uh, the previous winner that in my last video, Lawrence of Arabia is 40 points. This guy's 50 points. Um, he also gets the 12 inch command range, two command points, plus two to tight initiative rolls. So now we're really getting a much better chance of being able to win those tight initiative rolls. Um, at the start of the game, you have three units with advanced setup. And then really what makes them expensive is the but your, your whole army gets one extra use of over the top. So I've not mentioned this before, but in Blood and Valor, we've not read the rules. Once a game, your commander can what do what I like to call blow the whistle. They, you order all of your men over the top, every single unit that is within the command range of your figure, so either eight or 12 points, um, can take a free move action. And then also you still have your regular command points to spend. So you can, if a good chunk of your, your army is within command range of your commander, you can move a huge chunk of your army forward four inches and then still throw out command points to do things like um, advance and, and um, do close assaults and things like that. So with Rommel getting two of those per game, that is tactically extremely interesting. He's also 50 points, which in a, if we're playing a, a base 150 point game, to put a 30 or points into your commander is a little, it's a little risky. I would really only take Rommel if you were playing a really big game but if you were you're gonna you're not gonna have the most units on the table but you can do the most with your units if you have Rama. and th these three different command options really give the germans some interesting things um, again younger I'm, I'm not so wild about him just from a use case but uh, ravenstein and rommel really interesting uh, moving on to our core units um, nothing super special about the german core units and you get a couple of the different unit form variants as it evolved over the years from the pickle helm to the um, to the stall helm and the the uniform variations just in shading. Uh, German riflemen like all riflemen they're four points per model. Uh, you can pay uh, optionally for grenades, uh, rifle grenades and uh, light machine guns. Inexperienced riflemen are only three points per model but they only give you two initiative points. They're also a little worse at a couple of things. They can only take grenades. Uh, they cannot take the more advanced weaponry. Uh, also, just remember, if you're playing an early war game, then you would not be able to take uh, light machine gun or rifle grenades. You, you could still take regular grenades. Um, support units wise, uh, much like the French and the British, they get a sniper, although the German sniper 
Uh, there's it's a one man unit. Remember, uh, all snipers in Golden Valley are one man units, except the British, which get a, a two man team. Um, I still think the snipers, which are eight points, are a really useful suppression machine. Um, killing things is not the point with the sniper. They they deal out extra fatigue, which is very useful. You have your heavy machine gun teams, pretty much identical to every other nation's heavy machine guns, rules wise, not in actuality. And then in early war list, you can take the cavalry. Uh, that picture is actually of a um, that is a colorized photograph from World War One. Uh, actually, a more mid to late war German. You can tell by the Stahlhelm and the gas mask. Uh, doing a little bit of reconnaissance there. Uh, and again, I, I have it, I, I believe I have heard, but uh, don't, I don't take my word for this, that there will be more uh, cavalry availability on the Eastern Front where there, um, there wasn't really trench warfare because the wide open spaces of Russia and also Eastern Germany uh, just did not really allow for trench warfare and thus cavalry could be more useful as kind of a mobile force there. All right, here's the heart of the Germans in Blood and Valor. They're close combat specialists. And we have the stormtroopers, seven points per model. They are some of the most expensive uh, basic infantry you can, well, not basic infantry, but you know, infantry figures you can have. Uh, they get the true grit that all Germans get, uh, where they're going to be hard to kill them in close combat. They get close combat specialists where they're going to be re-rolling failed close combat attacks. So not only are they harder to kill, but they kill more effectively in close combat. And then they get that advanced setup rule that I talked about a little bit back with the commanders where at the very beginning of the game, uh, after they set up before uh, everyone activates, they can move eight inches to start to get into position. I think the stormtroopers are a little expensive and I think this mainly comes down to the fact that they're the only unit in the entire game that gets the submachine gun. The submachine gun is um, it's well, it's like a rifle, but instead of having unlimited range uh, in Blood and Valor, uh, the submachine gun only has a maximum range of 12 inches, which is not very far. Um, you are very often going to be outside of 12 inches, uh, and thus the, your stormtroopers are very often going to spend a lot of the game not shooting until they get within 12 inches. Now, within 12 inches, it's a totally normal weapon, except when within they're within four inches. Within four inches all of your stormtroopers are gonna get double shots. So if you have a squad, say, of, of uh, well, stormtroopers are up to a maximum of eight. You have a squad of eight stormtroopers, that's all of a sudden 16 shots. And if you get within four inches, they come with grenades. So now that's plus the extra three shots of the grenades. Now you're up to 19 shots. That's overwhelming. Stormtroopers are almost more deadly outside of close combat than they are in close combat. The only problem is, remember, there's seven points for model. So in order to feel all eight of them, that's 56 points. That's a lot of points. That's, that's well, it's a lot. <laughs> it's double. Uh, you could you know, almost get um, two pretty decently sized regular infantry squads for that. So are stormtroopers worth it? It's really hard for me to say. I think stormtroopers are great at maybe being more of a threat than actually doing damage, you force your opponent to react to them and then use that to put them out of position and attack them with the rest of your force. It's kind of my personal feelings on, I'm sure someone's using stormtroopers very effectively. Um, and just as an FYI, the submachine guns the stormtroopers used, uh, you do not need to model your stormtrooper figures with the MP-18 submachine guns. Uh, the Germans, I'm not going to say the Germans invented some machine guns, people would argue the Italians did, but the Germans were the first uh, army to field them in any large quantities, and it still wasn't even that large of a quantity, even at the very end of the war. So a lot of stormtroopers went into, most stormtroopers went into combat with rifles, with pistols, and with buckets of grenades, as you can see in the stormtroopers photographed up on the top right. So you don't have to model them with submachine guns. You could throw one or two of them in for flavor. If you really want all of your guys to be pictured with submachine guns, it's totally fine. But if you want your stormtroopers to be uh, appropriate for more of the war than just the very end of the war with a relatively rare MP-18 weapon, you know, doing with rifles, doing with pistols, doing with grenades, they still count as having submachine guns because they're supposed to be um, according to the author, uh, Rufus Devane, the fact that they don't all have submachine guns, but rules-wise they do, is more about the fact that they uh, were highly specialized in close combat.
um, more so than even some of the close combat specialists of other armies. Um, onto the other close combat specialist team, which isn't quite the same because it's not a large squad. It's really just a two-man team. That's the flamethrower. It's 20 points. Um, the, fun, the, the downside of the flamethrower is it can only be fired twice and has a four-inch range. You have to get that flamethrower up close, and there's only two models there, so it's pretty easy to die. The thing is, it rolls as many dice as there are models in the target. Now, if you're shooting at a lone sniper, that is a waste. But if you're shooting at a eight or 10 or 12 man unit, all of a sudden you are rolling buckets of dice and flamethrowers ignore cover. And they also have a special uh, dice rolling mechanic where they don't use the normal uh, shooting rules. They use their own special shooting rules, which effectively means they have a 56% success rate whenever they fire. So you shoot, at a unit, you are statistically going to delete half of it, which means they are devastating. You can only fire them twice though. Once they fire twice, they're removed from the game to represent that they've used all their fuel. Um, like the stormtroopers, I think they're almost better as a threat than as an actual damage dealer because you can slowly move the flamethrower team up. By the way, they also come with it, um, advanced setup so they get that free eight inch run at the beginning of the game. Um, so you can really make your opponent need to stop and deal with the flamethrowers or else, well, they'll be set on fire and they're really not going to like that. Uh, now, other than the Western Front, the base Blood and Valor book also comes with a list for Germans in East Africa. There were uh, African colonies for Germany, and they did not have significant numbers of forces there, but they did fight through the entire war in East Africa as a secondary theater. So of course, you've got your standard command options. Uh, as a specialty commander, you have Lieutenant Colonel Paul ML von Leto Vorbeck, the man with an extremely long name. Uh, he was nicknamed the Lion of Africa, and he was the head of the entire East African German forces, um, all of them, uh, both the native Germans, uh, European Germans, and also the native troops that fought. Uh, with the Germans that were part of their um, colonies. And he, he knew he was vastly outnumbered by the, by the British and he knew he was never gonna beat the British. So he acted as a uh, hit and run tactician, slinking away into the jungles, attacking the British where they were weak, running away when he was outnumbered. And he really succeeded in drawing British troops away from the other fronts, especially like in Europe, and uh, making them come down to Africa to try to deal with him. And he, he pretty much was at large right up to the end of the war where he surrendered two days after the armistice was signed. Um, for the actual um, units that the East African Germans can take, they, they actually can take three different kinds of core riflemen, the Schutztruppe, the Askari, and the Naval Riflemen. We'll talk about that in a second. They also have snipers, heavy machine guns, close combat specialists. They don't have cavalry. They don't have flamethrowers. Um, they get artillery barrages, but they don't get gas barrages. Instead, they get the uh, naval gun barrage, which is essentially a jumbo-sized artillery barrage, which slightly more often will accidentally hit you instead of your enemy. Uh, so again, this is uh, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Paul M. L. Von Leto Vorbeck. He's 40 points, so tied for the second most expensive, um, with Rommel being first, and then him and Lawrence of Arabia being second, which is uh, fair because he was often compared to Lawrence of Arabia, it was often called the kind of the German Lawrence of Arabia, uh, but in Africa, uh, less that he was stirring up locals to fight against the British and more with his hit and run tactics. Um, he gets his 12 inch command range. He gets three command points, which is enormous. As long as he is up and going, uh, any, he can issue to three separate units within 12 inches of him every turn. That's a lot. Is it worth the 40 points? Not sure. Um, also, you get a bit of diminishing returns there because you might not always have three active units within 12 inches of him. You probably will, but every once in a while you might not. And so that third point, every once in a while might go to waste. He can spend it on himself, but it's only him and two uh, riflemen to support him. So not, not so useful spending on himself. Uh, he gets his plus one to tight initiative rolls, and then he also gets the three advanced setup special rule, kind of like Rommel. So very aggressive play style where you're going to try to get your infantry units right up into the enemy's face. Uh, for the core riflemen, this is where the East Africans really have some in interesting choices. They have the Schutztruppe, which are the um, German Europeans serving in 
East Africa. Um, and they had some, they had uniforms that were pretty similar to the European German uniforms, but instead of being in field gray, they were in a bit of a sand or a very light khaki. Um, they also had a variety of different helmets and hats. You, they've got kind of that uh, slouch hat looking thing up there. Uh, also the variety that uh, a lot of them were pith helmets. So you've got some modeling opportunities there. Uh, they don't have access to grenades and uh, rifle grenades. And honestly, I'm not a big fan of rifle grenades, but they do have access to light machine gun, which is almost an auto include in any squad you have access to it. And because they're five points for model, they have a better shoot score and a better resolve score than your standard four point rifleman. So I think that extra point for being better shots is, is worth it. I really think it's worth it. Uh, the Ascari riflemen, which were the native African riflemen who served with Germany, they are four points per model. They still keep true grit, but they also pick up blood curdling charge, meaning they get that minus one of their close combat score, which is a good thing, on the turn where they charge, but they get a slightly worse shoot score than regular riflemen, but they get a better resolve score, so they're going to stick around longer. I really like this combination of the shoots troop as your um, fire, kind of your fire teams uh, laying down fire and then allowing the Ascari to move up so they can actually do their charges. I, mean, I really like this combination. Um, if the Ascari become kind of a budget close combat team. You also have your naval riflemen. They are effectively your inexperienced riflemen for the East African Germans. During uh, the East African front, uh, there was a, a German ship, the SMS Konigsberg, um, which they had to abandon. And thus the um, sailors on that ship served as ground troops. And also those um, naval artillery that I mentioned before, those are actually not naval artillery from the ship. They took the cannons with them when they abandoned the ship. And so they had to, uh, they lug them around and use them. They were just really big artillery pieces. Uh, the naval riflemen actually can take light machine guns. And as far as I'm aware, they're the only inexperienced rifle team, uh, rifle squad that can take light machine guns. Uh, in terms of support units, pretty straightforward. They have snipers, they have heavy machine gun team, and they have a close combat specialist team, which in the rules specify it can be either shoot Stripa, the European Germans, or the Ascari, the Native Africans. Uh, they are pretty much copycats of the Stormtroopers, some points for model, true grit, close combat specialist, advanced setup. The only difference is they don't get submachine guns, they get rifles. Um, and so they actually have unlimited range, but they don't get double shots within 12 inches. I'm going to be honest, I think that's actually a more than worthwhile trade-off. I think the rifles are better than the submachine guns because they are more versatile. Um, so I think uh, if you're fine losing out on access to the flamethrower and the gas attack, the East African list can actually offer you um, more interesting opportunities from a purely mechanical standpoint. I think it might be a better list mechanically than the Western from Germans. So thank you very much everyone for listening to why play the Germans. I think the Germans are gonna be a great force to play, especially if you already know you got, you got friends who wanna play the game and one of them's like, I wanna play the British because someone always wants to play this. I wanna play the French. You know, you gotta have someone to play with. You can't have British fighting against the French. I mean, you can, it's a game, do whatever you want, but you know, someone's gotta play central power. No one really wants to play Austria or the Ottoman Empire. That's not true. I know people who do want to play Austria and the Ottoman Empire, but let's all admit it. You want to play the Germans. The Germans are cool because they're the bad guys. Even if they're not really the bad guys, they're kind of the bad guys. So um, the next video up in this um, series is likely going to be looking at the American army. Um, kind of the, I know they came in late, but we can kind of consider them the, the third biggest of the uh, Entente powers. And then after that, all we have left are a couple of smaller armies, uh, the Anzacs, the Belgians, and the Ottomans that we'll be looking at. So uh, I might do uh, just two videos for those last couple. I'm also planning on uh, releasing a video and a document going into some very minor rules modifications for playing Blood and Valor in 15 millimeter, uh, which is one of my first videos, uh, just adjusting some of the ranges so you can play on a smaller table. Um, so I'm going to be releasing them at, at that some point. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And please go out, support Firelock Games, buy Blood and Valor. It is a fantastic game, uh, both from a historical perspective and also mechanically, I think it's quite good. And uh, go support them. 
Uh, I have absolutely no monetary stake in this. It's just, I love this game and I think you sh should buy it. So uh, you all have a good day and I will see you later.